Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly Bible study. This is going to be our next to the last lesson in uh, Genesis. We're going to do chapters 42 through 45 today and then next week will be our last study in Genesis. So let's just pray and get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the lessons that we've learned throughout this amazing book. Father, thank you for today's lesson as we learn to reconcile, not to get revenge, as we learn to trust your plan. Father, you, you teach us so much through your word. Help us to have open hearts and open minds to not only hear it, but to learn from it and to apply it to our lives, which is the purpose of your word. So, Father, forgive us where we're so hard-headed and hard-hearted sometimes and help us to just be your vessels used for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, um, there's actually more between the lessons this week than there is in the lesson that was in our materials, but I'm not going to leave any of it out. So we're just going to have to dive in. Um, this is going to be kind of like your mom telling you a Bible story for the most of it. So we will start with the beginning of chapter 42 and go all the way to chapter 45 where our lesson is today. So Joseph, through his ups and downs, God had prepared him for the position of leadership that he was in. He was in charge of the suit, the food supply for the nation that was literally the breadbasket of the world in that day. And they were now facing the worst famine that history had ever known. He had collected one-fifth of the grain and the food supplies every year during those seven years of of plenty that God had promised, and now those seven years have come to an end. And they didn't just come to an end in Egypt, they came to an end throughout the known world. And so it hit Canaan very hard. Canaan is not that the land of Canaan, Israel today, not that far from Egypt. And so it had hit them very hard. People were coming from every country to buy food from Egypt. And so Jacob and his family were no different. So Jacob sends his 10 oldest sons to Egypt to buy food. He does not send Benjamin. He keeps Benjamin at home with him, but he sends the 10 older sons to Egypt to buy food. These are the sons of Leah and the two handmaids. Uh, the timeline is not what I would call perfectly clear about whether Benjamin was born before they sent Joseph off to Egypt into slavery. Most scholars agree that yes, he was born. Um, he, We are told in chapter 35 that Rachel dies giving birth to Benjamin. And then in chapter 37 is where the brothers sold Joseph into slavery to go to Egypt. And so provided that those are in chronological order, which there's no absolute guarantee that they are, he would have already been born. He would have, we don't know how old he was or anything, but he would have already been born. So when Joseph's brothers arrive in Egypt, Jacob sends them to Egypt to buy food. They bow down to him. And they call themselves his servant. You remember Joseph's first dream when he told, told his brothers about his first dream. And he said, I dreamed that we were in the field and, and we were making these sheaves of grain. And all of the sheaves bowed down to my sheaf of grain. And uh, the brothers said, you, you mean you think we're going to bow down to you? We'll never bow down to you. Remember, they thought he was just a spoiled brat, dad's favorite. And so um, that dream does come true. Scholars believe that Jacob probably, I mean, Joseph was probably 16, 17 uh, when they sold him into slavery. And he was 30. The scripture tells us that he was 30 when he started serving Pharaoh. So the seven good years are over. And they're in the famine. We don't know yet exactly how far into the famine. We know when the brothers come back the second time that it's two years into the famine because Joseph tells them there are five more years of famine still ahead of us. So Joseph is at least 37 
when he sees his brothers. And he looks like an Egyptian. We kind of talked about that last week. His head is shaven. Uh, he has a fake beard. They used the horse hair and things like that and kind of glued it all together and often just had kind of the goatee. Some of them had a little more than that. And having a beard was reserved for the highest of the high. It wasn't for anyone. Most Egyptian men were clean shaven, head, everything. So he looked like an Egyptian to them. And he didn't, he recognized his brothers, but they didn't recognize him. Joseph had some tests for his brothers before he was going to tell them who he was and that he was their brother, Jacob. Were these those same cold hearted guys that that were willing to put him in the bottom of a cistern and let him just die of uh, thirst in it or and then eventually pulled him out and sold him into slavery to be taken into Egypt? Has, has their character, has their character changed? But what we see is Joseph did not reveal himself to them, even though he recognized them. He talks to them harshly. He maintains his character. He maintains his role of this Egyptian leader, and they do not know the difference. And he says, where are you from? Are you spies? Have you just come to check out the weaknesses of our nation? And there's like, no, no, we're not spies. We're your servants. Again, reiterating that we're your servants. We've just come here to buy food. We're honest men. We're, we're sons. We're all sons of one man. There were 12 of us, and there's still a younger one with our father, and one is no more. And of course, the one that was no more would have been Joseph. Joseph says, no, you're spies. Here's a test for you. And so Joseph begins his testing season on his brothers. And he says, and he puts them in prison for three days. And then he tells them, he says, one brother will remain in prison while the others go get the younger brother to prove to me that you're not lying. So the brothers discuss this and, and they talk about how they, they say, we're being, we're being punished for what we did to Joseph. That when he was begging for his life, we didn't spare him. And Reuben, Reuben steps up again. Remember when they were, when they put Joseph in the, in the cistern, Reuben says, you should not do this against this boy. You should not do this. And Reuben says, I told you not to sin against that boy and you wouldn't listen. And so instead of killing him, leaving him there to die in the bottom of that cistern, they did pull him out and allowed him to live, and they sold him into slavery uh, from the, car the Midianite caravan that was going to Egypt. And so at this time, Joseph is speaking to them in Egyptian. He has an interpreter. They had no idea that Joseph could understand every word that they were saying. And Joseph had to turn away and weep. So we're going to see Joseph weep three times. He had to turn away and weep. And instead of Reuben, the oldest, he says, he says, Simeon will be kept and bound. So they, he had Simeon bound and taken away as they watched. Because we have to believe that it was because Reuben had spoken up for him not to kill him when, he, when they were going to leave him in the cistern. And so Joseph had their supply bags, their sacks filled with food products, with grain. And then he also put the silver that they had brought to pay him with back in their sacks. So on their trip back home to Canaan, they discover that their silver is in their bags. And they're thinking, oh, this is not good. This is not good. That man, that leader in Egypt wasn't very happy with us in the first place. He thought we were spies. And now here's our silver in our bags. What is God doing to us? So they make it home and they tell Jacob everything about their experiences and that this Egyptian leader wants them to bring back Benjamin to prove that they weren't spies. And Jacob is not happy. He says, you lost Joseph the first time. Now you've lost Simeon and there is no way you're getting my Benjamin and taking him back. There's just no way. 
And <clears throat> he, he basically, Benjamin was the only part of Rachel that he had left. Rachel had died in childbirth with, with Benjamin. And of course, Joseph, he believed that Joseph had been torn apart by the animals. They brought back his blood-stained coat of many colors that Jacob had made for him. And so he says, you're not getting, you're not getting Benjamin. And, but chapter 43 rolls around and the famine just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And so Jacob tells his sons, he says, you've got to go, you've got to go back to Egypt. You've got to go get us more food. And, and Judah says, we cannot go back to Egypt without Benjamin. That ruler made it very clear that we were not to see his face again unless we had our younger brother with us. So Jacob finally has no choice but to agree. So they took double the silver. They took gifts of spices and uh honey and nuts and everything that they did have, even though they didn't have grain, and they took Benjamin, and they returned to Egypt. And so when Joseph saw his brothers and he saw Benjamin, he told his servants, he said, go to my house and, and prepare, kill, kill an animal and prepare a dinner for them and bring Simeon out and return Simeon to them. So when Joseph gets home, he asks if their father is still alive, he makes conversation with them, and he asks if their father is still alive. And uh, we know at this time that it's about two years uh, into the famine, and we know that Joseph wept again. And then Egyptians could not sit with Hebrews because Hebrews were considered unclean to them. They were not like to the Jews, but they were just kind of considered an abomination. And so they could not sit together because they thought that he was a Hebrew. And so Jacob very surprisingly seats them in birth order. They are looking at each other like, mm, how did he know what order to put us in? And Benjamin was given five times as much as anyone else. And then in chapter 44, Joseph orders their sacks filled again with grain and food products and tells his servant to put the silver back in their bags again and to hide his silver cup, Joseph's silver cup, in Benjamin's bag, in Benjamin's sack. So they're on their way. They think all is good, and they're on their journey back home. They have Simeon back. Benjamin is safe, and they're on their journey home, and they're feeling pretty good about it. And then Joseph sends men to catch up with them. And the men say, someone has stolen our master's silver cup. And they're like, no, none of us would do that. None of us would do that. If you find that silver cup in any of our stuff, the one whose sack you find it in will go back and be a slave. Go back and be his slave. Anyone caught with that silver cup will be their slave. So they look, they start with Reuben and they look through his sack and then they go to to uh Simeon, and they look through his sack, and then to Judah, and on down the list, and they don't find the silver cup until they come to Benjamin's sack, and there's the silver cup. They tear their clothes, and they fall on their faces on the ground, and Judah begins to beg, and he says, this is our father's only son of his mother. His brother is dead, torn apart by the, the animals, this is the first time Joseph even knows what they told their father happened to him. And if anything, and Judah continues, he says, if anything happens to this young man, he will take our father to his grave. Please, please do not do this. Take me instead. I will be your slave, but allow Benjamin to go home to our father. So Joseph has tested his brothers and they passed. They're not those same cold-hearted men that they were when they put him in the cistern and when they sold him into slavery. He knows that um, what they told his father about him, that he was probably torn apart by the animals, but he also knows that Judah was willing to sacrifice himself to save Benjamin and to not hurt his father. And that's where our study materials begin today for uh, this lesson.
But again, as always, I just think it's really important that you know that background to today's to today's lesson. So in uh, chapter 45, verses 1 through 3, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept slow, so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Joseph is about to lose it. He's having dinner in his home. His brothers are all seated there, including Benjamin. He's been told that his father is still alive, and he's about to lose it. And so he cries out, he hollers out in this stern voice that he's maintained, this staying in character. He calls out to clear the room, get these servants out of here, clear the room. And so only he and his brothers are left in the room when he reveals, I am Joseph. It's been at least 22 years since he saw his brothers and Benjamin. And now the questions change. It's no longer, is your father alive? It's, is my father alive? The questions become personal now. Joseph was crying so loud that his attendants heard him and Pharaoh's household was informed of it. The brothers, the brothers can't even respond. The brothers don't even know what to do. Imagine what all's flying through their heads at this moment. This Egyptian leader, first of all, is speaking our language. What have we said that he understood? He cleared the room. There's no more interpreter in there. What, has, what have we said in Hebrew that he's understood all along? And this Egyptian leader, this strong man who's talked so rough to us, who laid down the rules to us, is now crying out loud. Is that normal? Is that normal? And oh my goodness, could this really be Joseph? The Joseph that we were willing to kill, that we sold into slavery, could this really be Joseph? And if it is, what in the world is he going to do with us? He has the authority to do anything in this world with us. He could torture us. He could kill us. He could enslave us. He could put us in prison. He can do anything with us. He has the power and authority to do it. We're helpless before him. And then, is he happy or is he mad? What is going on? They have no idea. The scripture says that they were unable to answer him and that they were terrified. Absolutely terrified. What had they what they had done to Joseph had already been flashing before their eyes. It had already been flashing before their eyes. And now, after this, it really was. And they knew that he had the authority to do anything he wanted to with them. And then in uh, verses, chapter 45, verses 4 through 8. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Joseph couldn't stand it anymore. He calls his brothers close to him and he begins explaining God's plan to them. In chapter 50, it will say, you intended this for harm to me, but God intended it for good. 
And that certainly applies here in chapter 45. And he tells them there are five more years of famine. There are five more years of famine that we have to endure. But God sent me ahead of you. God sent me here. Don't be mad at yourselves. Don't blame yourselves. God sent me here. That was just his way to get me here. And then he prepared me. Oh, the things they had to talk about. And then he prepared me. And now I'm the father of Pharaoh. Not literally his father, but his advisor. The one who's wise and who, and who advises Pharaoh. And he did it so that I could be the deliverer of my people. God had a plan. It wasn't you that did it. It was God. You couldn't have planned this and you couldn't have pulled it off. But God did. You know, it's absolutely amazing. When we look back across God's completed plans, how detailed and intricate they are. What a pattern they weave. He doesn't miss anything. Every day in Joseph's life was to prepare him for this moment. How he, how he trained and molded him before he was taken to Egypt from childhood to worship him and serve him. He was taught a good foundation in the Lord, and he was able to hang on to that his entire time in Egypt because Egypt didn't know his God. And yet, Joseph never faltered and never failed and never grew weak in his God. And how he was given the leadership roles that he had in Potiphar's house and, and in the prison, it enabled him to learn the culture, to learn the language, to understand the government, to know the agriculture. It prepared him for this role that he was standing in today. Everything necessary to bring deliverance to his people, just as God had planned from the very beginning. And then in verses 9 through 15, Hurry now back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves and you can my, uh, <clears throat> you can see for yourselves and so can my brother Benjamin that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen and bring my father down here quickly. Then he will throw his arms around. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Joseph had been patient up to this point, but now he says, hurry, go get my father. Go get my father and bring him here to me. Tell my father about me. Tell my father about the honor that's been bestowed on me in Egypt. How God has used me that he sent me ahead of you to be in this place at this time. You see, this is how the Israelites got to Egypt. God had a plan all along how the Israelites would get to Egypt, and this is it. As Jacob and his family come to Egypt to avoid the famine. And Joseph tells them, bring your children and bring your grandchildren, bring your flocks and your herds, bring everything that you have, and I will give you the land of Goshen. We talked last week about that rich Nile River Valley, about that rich Nile River Delta, and that's exactly the area of land that Joseph was able to give his people. Remember the second dream of Joseph, where he saw the sun and the moon and all the stars bow down to him? Jacob scolded him 
for that for telling that dream. But it says Jacob did not forget the dream. And of course, this is where that second dream, the prophecy of that second dream will be fulfilled because Jacob will come to Egypt. Jacob will be at Joseph's mercy. And they all bow down to Jacob, to Joseph, I mean. Joseph's mother, Rachel, is dead. She died giving birth to Benjamin. But Leah and the two maidservants that have borne Jacob's sons are still alive. And so they will all bow down to him. I have more than one ending and more than one conclusion for this week's lesson. The first one, this lesson just teaches us so many things. We could spend hours on just what this les this one lesson teaches us. But I want to talk about the lesson of reconciliation. Joseph chose to reconcile, not to retaliate. He chose to forgive and to forget. God forgives and he forgets. The scripture says our sin is as far as the east is from the west when God forgives it. That's our example. We can't say, yeah, I'll forgive you, but I can't ever forget about it. I'll never forget it. That's not the way it works. We have to let the past go. We have to have do-overs. And when we do do-overs, we can't throw them up to those that we've forgiven. We have mulligans if you're a golfer. Um, it's not complete forgiveness if it isn't wiped away. We have to let the past go, whether it's um, a reconciliation between a parent and a child, between siblings, between friends, between marriage partners, wherever that reconciliation is, we have to let the past go to have complete reconciliation. Um, my age <laughs> has uh, helped me a little bit with that. When I was younger, when someone did me wrong, I was just done with them. I was through with them. And I had trouble ever forgiving them, and I, our relationship would never be the same. I've learned through Christ's love, I've learned as I've gotten older, that we can't live like that, that we just can't live like that, that we have to let the past go. It hurts us. It hurts others too. But bottom line, it hurts us when we don't do that. But the second ending that I want to kind of draw to conclusion with this lesson is to compare the similarities of the life of Joseph with the life of Jesus. The other day I was kind of talking about Joseph and, and this area of Genesis with my son-in-law, and he said, he said, there's something I studied about all the different comparisons between Joseph and Jesus, and we didn't really talk about it long, but it just really made me begin to think there are so many likenesses and so many common similarities. I'm just going to do a few. These are just some that I thought of very quickly, and one is Joseph wept three times. He didn't weep over being mistreated by his brothers. He didn't weep over being a slave. He didn't weep over being thrown in prison. He wept over those he loved. Jesus wept three times. Not over his beatings, not over betrayals, not over rejection, not even over the crucifixion, but over what he loved. He wept over Lazarus' death. I don't believe he wept over Lazarus being dead because he knew full well he was going to restore life to Lazarus. He wept because Mary and Martha were so hurt. They were grieving so deeply, and they were disappointed and hurt that their brother had died. He wept over Jerusalem. How many times did I want to just bring you under my wing like a mother hen does her chicks? But no. And he, in Hebrews, where he prayed to the Father over his ministry, he wept because of those that he loved and those that he was ministering to. The patience of Joseph and Jesus, never complaining, no matter what happened. Joseph goes from favored son to a slave. Jesus goes from the Son of God to the suffering servant on earth. 
from heaven, the Son of God in heaven, on the throne to the suffering servant on earth that was mistreated and betrayed. Joseph goes from a slave and a prisoner to ruler of the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And Jesus goes from the suffering servant here on earth to be king of glory at the right hand of God. Joseph was the deliverer of his people. Jesus is the deliverer of all mankind. Joseph's brothers held his life in their hands and they sacrificed him. The Jews held Jesus' life in their hands and they sacrificed him. Both were sacrificed because of jealousy. The brothers sacrificed Joseph because they were jealousy. They were jealous over the way his fa their father loved Joseph, how favored he was. The Jews sacrificed Jesus because they were jealous of his popularity and they feared that he was a threat to their way of life. Joseph's brothers and the Jews intended their treatment for harm, but God intended it for good. Both thought they did it. The Jews thought they killed Jesus. The brothers thought they killed Joseph. But instead, God had caused it all to happen. Joseph held his brothers' hand, lives in his hands, and he chose forgiveness and mercy. He chose reconciliation. Jesus holds our lives in his hands, and he chooses forgiveness and mercy, and he reconciles us in spite of our sin to the Father. Joseph prepared a place for his people. He gave them the very best part of Egypt, the land of Goshen. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us in heaven. I just think those are absolutely miraculous comparisons. Almost that pre-manifestation of what Jesus would do. You know, they swore, the brothers swore that they would never bow down to Joseph, but they did. And many will not bow down to Jesus, but they will at his second coming. There's nothing negative said in scripture about Joseph. And Daniel, uh, my son-in-law reminded me of this also. And Daniel, I don't believe there's anything negative said about Daniel. And as far as I know, those are probably the only two uh, people that Scripture re doesn't record something negative about and Scripture other than Jesus. And Scripture records nothing negative about Jesus. And like last week's study, Joseph had the power to get even. He had the power to retaliate against his brothers, just like he had had the power to retaliate against Potiphar's wife. But he chose forgiveness and mercy. He chose to let the past go. What a lesson for us as Christians. What a lesson for us. A great forefather of our faith. You know, I'm surprised that when we call out the patriarchs and we say, Abraham, jo uh, Isaac, and Jacob, that we don't say Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph because of his role and because of being such a forefather of our faith. He could have blamed God. He could have retaliated against his brothers. He had every opportunity to forsake his faith, but he didn't. He didn't let power go to his head. He didn't let hard times turn him against his God. He chose to be faithful to God's plan, whatever it was. And he didn't know God's plan. That's, that's the amazing part. We look back and we see how perfectly this whole plan just falls into place. Joseph didn't have that opportunity. He just stayed faithful and he gave God credit in the end when it did all fall in place. But Joseph did not have the end in sight all those years when he remained faithful. So faithful to the plan is what we have to be, even when we do not have the end in sight. Thank you.